1996, Northwestern University football attended the Rose Bowl, one of the oldest bowl games in history. They had not been to a bowl game since 1949, and this 50-year drought came to an end with the help of their star sophomore running back, Darnell Autry. Darnell Autry finished the season as a Heisman finalist, but at the university, he was a drama major who was pursuing an acting career after football. This drama major was out offered a movie role in the summer of 1996 for a movie filming in Italy. The NCAA ruled that if he had took this movie role, that he would be unable to finish his last two years as a collegiate amateur athlete. Darnell Autry took this to the court, and eventually it got ruled that if he was allowed to pursue the movie role, but not be paid for his movie role, and only his actual expenses would be paid, like airfare and hotel. Darnell Autry is just one of the many student athletes who are unjustly affected by the NCAA system of intercollegiate athletics. The NCAA system of intercollegiate athletics is a multi-billion dollar industry, with the NCAA alone pulling in a revenue in 2012 of $872 million. This multi-billion dollar industry leads profits for everyone involved, everyone except for the collegiate athlete. The NCAA, or Na National Collegiate Athletic Association, is the ruling body for majority of intercollegiate athletics. This system of intercollegiate athletics is subdivided into three divisions. Division I is where I will be spending a majority of my time since I will be dealing with elite college athletics, which for the purposes of my thesis will be defined as the money-making sports of NCAA Division I's men's football and men's basketball. Former NCAA President Walter Byers saw the problem with the NCAA system of intercollegiate athletics while he was president and said, I was charged with the dual mission of keeping intercollegiate sports clean while generating millions of dollars of profits for their universities. These were compelling and competing tasks, he says. I proved barely adequate in the first instance, but enormously successful in my second instance. I am arguing that the student that the NCAA should rewrite their amateurism rules in order to allow student athletes the ability to pursue compensation from outside their university. I want to clarify that I am not arguing that the university should pay the athlete in any way apart from their scholarship. In fact, I am only arguing that the student athlete have the option to go outside of the university and pursue compensation in areas like a commercial deal or advertisement deals and sponsorship. Student athlete is a term used to is a term used for a student who is enrolled in a university who also participates through intercollegiate athletics for their university. These student athletes are considered amateur and are must follow the amateurism rules, which are set about by the NCAA yearly. These although these student athletes are considered amateur, most of them receive full scholarships in elite college athletics. In Division I men's basketball, there are, schools are allowed to give 13 full-ride scholarships. And for Division I men's football, your schools are allowed to give from 63 to 85 scholarships, depending on their distinction in college football. <coughs> the student athlete must be allowed to pursue compensation from outside their university. And I am arguing that this will be happening due to three factors. One, that the student athlete is working and that justice necessitates that they be allowed to pursue compensation for this work. Second, the current NCAA amateurism rules create unnecessary and unjust prohibitions on the student athlete. And finally, that this system of intercollegiate athletics is continually growing in professionalization and that the student athlete must be allowed to pursue compensation from this professionalization as well. Student athletes are not seen as workers, and this is due to two false ideas concerning intercollegiate athletics. One, that college sports are not employment, that they are a leisure activity. And second, that these student athletes are not working the same amount of hours as someone who's working a more, tra more traditional job. In the late 1700s, the British created our system of modern day intercollegiate athletics. When they created this system, they linked the idea of a leisure activity to them. And so amateurism came about. 
But in today's college sports world, it is anything but an amateur leisure activity. In fact, it is employment. When one hears the term employment, their first thought may go to office work or factory work, not to college sports stars. But this is just due to a lack of defining both leisure and employment. A leisure activity and employment is not distinguished by whether the activity is enjoyable or not, but, why, but whether there is constraints on the activity and whether there is time requirement involved. In their book, College Athletes for Hire, Sack and Skorowski argue that the critical factor in differentiating employment from leisure is what they call instrumental constraint. This is where instruments, such as material rewards and resources, are used to control or constrain the participant on an activity. Using this definition of employment, we can see how these student athletes are employed. They receive scholarships yearly from these cut schools. But these schools use university officials and coaches to control, to control and constrain the student athlete in this activity. The student athlete is not seen to be working the same amount of hours as someone who's working a more traditional job. But this is just due to a false idea of a student athlete's day. In fact, student athletes work more than 40 or more hours a week. This can be seen clearly by a day in the life of a Division I men's football player. Yes, the screen is very full. It is a very full day. This is done daily throughout the season, from practice for weightlifting, to film studies, to then on the field practice. And on top of all that, you have to go to classes like any other student at the university. These student athletes are working more, more than 40 hours a week, just like anyone else who is working a more traditional job. Although these student athletes work many hours a week, so do many others in the industry of intercollegiate sports, like college coaches. These college coaches work many hours like the student athlete and deserve to be appropriately compensated for this labor. What is important to realize here is the absolute lack of ability for the student athlete to pursue compensation for his work, while these college coaches and other officials in the NCAA system are able to pursue this multi-billion dollar industry for many profits. This can be seen clearly with the 2017 coaches' salaries for basketball and football. In 2017, head coaches' salaries for football ranged from three to eleven million dollars per year, and for college basketball, two to seven million dollars a year. Again, it is important to realize not that these coaches do not deserve the money they are making, but that the student athlete isn't also allowed to pursue compensation for their work. This system of corruption does not just stop at the college level. It leads down into high school and even post-college life for these student athletes. The high school corruption can easily be seen in areas of like the Under Armour All-American game for star football high school players, or the McDonald's All-American game for high school basketball players. These games are televised for the nation to watch, and they are high school players, seniors just like us today. This can also be seen after college with areas like jersey sales. An athlete's jersey is his image to the fans and the universities for the rest of his life. The selling of this jersey is the selling of his image. And this selling of his image should give him compensation. But under NCAA amateurism rules right now, an athlete is allowed to sell an the university is allowed to sell an athlete's jersey to fans who are wanting them without giving any compensation to the deserving athlete, with all the compensation given to the university and the apparel company itself. This system is unjust, but in order for us to realize it is unjust, we must realize what justice is. This is exactly what two ancient philosophers, Cicero and Aristotle, give us, a great definition of justice. Cicero says that justice requires what is due, and Aristotle builds on this point by saying, justice is that virtue of the soul which is distributive according to deserved. Cicero and Aristotle both see that what is due to the student athlete is based off of what they proceed for the what they produce for the university itself. But as Christians, our ultimate authority does not just lie in two ancient philosophers. In fact, the Bible deals with this justice just as much as these two ancient philosophers do in many areas throughout the Old and New Testament. In Deuteronomy, 
Moses tells the Israelites not to muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain. And Jesus builds upon this in Luke when he says that the laborer deserves his wages. To put these both together, Paul in 1 Timothy 5.18 discusses that the laborer deserves fruit of his labors. And he goes on to say that when the laborer does not receive the fruit of his labors, that this is unjust to the laborer itself. My second argument is that this NCAA amateurism rules, as they are right now, create unjust and unnecessary prohibitions on student-athletes. This can be seen in the two stories of these unfortunate student-athletes, Rob Gray and Donald De La Haye. Rob Gray is a senior guard for the University of Houston men's basketball team. At the beginning of the 2017-2018 season, he was unable to participate in the team's opening game. The reason because? He participated in a church league basketball event that summer, in which a friend paid $5 to have him participate and grow in his Christianity with other Christians through basketball. He was forced to sit out his home opening game as a senior because of this rule. Donald De La Haye, on the other hand, was a kicker for the University of Florida's University of Central Florida's football team. In the summer of 2017, he lost his full ride scholarship to the university, all because of his YouTube channel. Donald De La Haye had started a YouTube channel in which he uh, posted kicking trick shots and day in the life videos. This YouTube channel became so popular that ad revenue became to him, started to come to him through this YouTube channel. The NCAA ruled that he was unable to continue this YouTube channel if he wanted to continue as an amateur student athlete in college football. And so he lost his full ride scholarship to the university because he did not want to follow the NCAA amateurism rules about a YouTube channel, apart from his athletic ability on the football field. Finally, I want to show you that this NCAA system of intercollegiate athletics is continually growing in uh, professionalization. This can be seen through three areas. The TV enterprise surround, surrounding college athletics, the postseason games in college athletics, and the amount that college stadiums have grown to today. The TV enterprise in college athletics is very similar to that of its professional counterpart. In fact, you can turn on the TV and almost always find a college game to watch on numerous channels, like ESPN, all the channels included with ESPN, CBS, or ABC. But if you still can't find what you're looking for, why don't you go to the specially created networks for different conferences and schools, like the SEC network for all the SEC schools, or the Longhorn network for the University of Texas. This enterprise treats college sports no differently than they would the professional sports. In fact, in 2014, it was average for the college football championship game that over an hour of extra time was added to the recorded game just for commercials. And in the 2011 March Madness tournament, it was average of 50 minutes extra per game just for commercials to run over these amateur athletes. This TV enterprise clearly shows the professionalization that the NCAA system is continually growing in. But this professionalization can also be seen in the postseason games. Both college football and college basketball have different postseason games. For college football, the bowl games are the highlight of the college football season. In fact, these college bowl games are sponsored by many different companies, all state. Capital One, or the Lockheed Martin Armed Forces Bowl. These companies sponsor everything from the gear the athletes wear, to the logo that goes on the field, to all the merchandise that is sold during the game and the commercials that are sold as well. All of this goes to promoting the company itself, making the student athlete a promotional outlet. The Final Four is the most professionalized stage in elite college athletics. The Final Four are the final four games in the NCAA's March Madness month-long tournament. This month-long tournament brings in a majority of the NCAA's revenue every year. 
In 2017, the revenue for the NCAA in the Final Four was a whopping $900 million. $900 million. It was averaged that in ticket sales alone, $74 million was made just to see the game in person. But obviously, the $74 million number does not add up to the $900 million I just gave you. That is because close to 23 million people watch the Final Four on their televisions around the world. This <coughs> opens a whole new door for professionalism to enter. And that is exactly what CBS did in 2011 when they purchased the sole exclusive rights to the Final Four for a whopping $21 billion. The Final Four and the College Bowl games clearly show the professionalization that these student athletes are participating in and certainly contributing to. But it does not stop there. A college football stadium directly <coughs> correlates to the amount of money the university can make off of ticket sales. The larger the stadium, the more ticket sales that they can make. In today's amateur college world, college football stadiums have started to dwarf the size of professional stadiums. To fully comprehend this, of the top 10 <coughs> largest stadiums in the world, eight of them are used for college football, with notable ones being the number nine University of Texas football stadium in Austin, or the number five stadium, the Texas A&M's football stadium, and the second largest stadium in the world, the University of Michigan's football stadium. To fully comprehend the numbers that I have just given you here and the seat amount, AT&T Stadium in Arlington, otherwise known as Jerry's World because of its large size, does not even make the top 20 largest stadium sizes in the world. In fact, no NFL stadium breaks the top 20 list. And in the top 20 list, 13 of them are for college football. The the stadium size, the postseason games, and the TV enterprise all show how this system is continually growing in professionalization. In conclusion, Dar Darnell Autry, Rob Gray, and Donald De La Haye are just a few of the many athletes who are unjustly affected by this system of intercollegiate athletics. I am arguing that the student athlete must be allowed to pursue compensation for their, per, for their abilities in this system of intercollegiate athletics. Student athletes are working, and this work is employment, and they are working many hours a week. These amateurism rules are unjust and have far-reaching prohibitions like Rob Gray and Donald De La Haye found out. And finally, this system is continually growing in professionalization. The NCAA needs to rewrite their amateurism rules in order to allow student athletes the ability to pursue compensation from outside their university. Thank you.